Hello, how are you? On behalf of Badminton Pan American Confederation, we give you the warmest welcome to our Coach Corner program. My name is Adrián Gómez, and today I am pleased to be your moderator. In today's program, we have the pleasure to welcome one of the most emblematic researchers in our sport. I'm talking about Dr. João Guilherme Cren from Brazil, who's going to talk about a very interesting topic. Understanding the game of badminton, what does science tell us? But before leaving you with him, I would like to read a short summary about our guest's career. Joao graduated in physical education at Unigamp. He also has a PhD in sports science. He is a personal trainer in soccer and racket sports. He is also a college professor and he is a member of the sports science nucleus of the Brazilian Badminton Confederation. He's a technical coordinator of uh, the Badminton Brazilian Confederation, and he has written different books and articles in soccer and badminton. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Joao. Good afternoon, Joao. Welcome to our program. Thank you for sharing with our audience and welcoming us to your home in Campinas, Sao Paulo. Please share your screen. The floor is yours. So let's go. And it's a pleasure for me to be here and to be invited for this presentation and talk a little bit about badminton and science. Um, I thank you, the Pan American Badminton Confederation for the invitation and I'm sharing my screen right now with all of you. Okay, I hope you are seeing everything's okay. Yeah, yeah, very good. Okay, so sorry about I'm not speaking in, port in Portuguese, but I, I, I would like to prefer to talk in English. Um, Portuguese is my native language, and English and, Port and Spanish is not, but I, 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 I just think that I'm better in English. And uh, first of all, before I start, I just want to tell you that um, sometimes I, I'm going to compare um, badminton with what, do, what does have an another uh, racket sport science studies like tennis and other uh, sports. It's just to make a comparison so we can see where we can go with badminton, okay? And so let's start. Um, if I ask you, how is the game of badminton? Nah? Uh, I just want to know what, what are the demands of the game of badminton? I'm not talking about the rules, the rules everybody knows, you know how, how, how long, how deep is the, the court, you know about the racket, you know about the shuttles, and that's not the answer for that question. When I'm talking about how is the game of badminton, I'm talking about how long does a rally or a rest time interval, rest time last. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you have ever thought about it, but um, this is a precious uh, information. So you can, you, you have to know to start to practice, to start to plan your practice. And another question that just to make a reflection would be how many strokes are executed in during a match in badminton, in a game, and in a point. Do you know that? Do you know the density of the game, of the match? And do you know the distance covered by a player during a match, um, during a game, and during a point? Um, all this information should be asked, should all these uh, questions should be asked, so you then you will find how is the game of badminton. Um, 
just to make a, com a comparison with tennis, look at this. Um, a tennis match, a tennis match, um, in general, just take like almost two hours total time. The rest time is one hour and 10 minutes. The effective playing time is just 37 minutes. In about the rest time, two minutes and 10 seconds is for change cards, depend on the rules, and 20 seconds between the points. About the effective playing time, 10, around 10 seconds the rally times, and the density of the game is one, two. Or, or that means one in effort and two in pause or rest. Um, in 10 seconds, the players make seven, uh, make seven shots per point. And the, the time of the uh, flying ball, it's about 1.5 seconds. And, and usually the players also make four change of directions per point. Um, total game, total, total the match, they make around almost 500 shots per match. The power uh, in contact with the ball should be around 11,000 kilograms. And the, in, during the effective playing time, 37 minutes, the distance covered is um, um, around 2,000 meters. And then the, just make a, and then the distance per set is around almost 500 meters. The distance per game, it's almost 100 meters. And the distance span per point, it's, around 15 meters. That means two meters distance per shot. When I have all this information, I can, I can understand the game. All this information here that I have is for, oops, it's not working. Come on. I think it's the internet, sorry about that. Uh, okay, now it's still. When I, when I have all, all this information, I can understand how is the game of badminton, how are the demands of the game of badminton. And then it's easy to plan the brackets. So after that, you could ask me, hey, John, but all this information must change because uh, if you consider the game level, the gender, if it's single, double, and other information, yes, that's true that all that information should change. So that's why the science really needs some more people understanding and trying to find all this information from the badminton games. Um, just make just attention because if you have the information from the elite level and you are practicing like um, national or even regional level or state level or beginners, and that's the, the information should not be used with your public, your student or your athletes because international level is too high for those players. And why should I know all that information? To practice. When I, when I just think about, oh, I have to do um, a practice and I'm gonna plan how are the load of this practice. And I mean, uh, the volume, the intensity, the density, and where can I find the informations to plan my practice from the game? So I have to understand the game for them make the plan. Um, science evidence can help us to be more effective during the training programs. And also success in sports depends on talent, quality, training, appropriate equipment, and sport science. That's a big important thing that we must pay attention, quality training. Is not training. I used to tell my students that um, if I train more and more and more, it won't be the best training. More is more, best is best. So I need more, I need best 
quality training and not just more and more and more training. I have to understand the difference from more training and best training. Okay, what the science show us? If you um, if you go to to a review, this is um, a study, a review study. Uh, it was pu published in 2020, and but just consider the papers until 2017. You can see all the papers, all the science. Um, it is use, um, it is um, it is made in Europe and Asia. That's the um, most powerful badminton in the world. In America, there is just a few studies in the United States. But later, after that, another paper that focus on a review in racket sports just show us. Uh, it was pub published last year, 2021. Just show us uh, that badminton has a whole bunch of papers and it's just take the first place in racket sports, okay, in, from the whole world. And it, we can see here that the studies in badminton is still increasing, especially after 2017. Um, we can see the dark blue in the bottom of the column that's going up. And also we can see two papers that um, I used to, um, I wrote with my, uh, my partner, Julia Barreira also. And that was the, uh, the, these two papers is the 20 most cited documents in global scale from all over uh, all racket sports. Uh, if you go to PubMed, that's uh, big science data in the world, the biggest science, science data in the world. And the publishing uh, in badminton is increasing. You can see in this graph, uh, it's getting a lot uh, more studied. And if we, if you, we uh, understand the science applied to sport, um, Bishop, 2008, just um, described a model so we can follow the steps and go to the highest level of um, a sport. And in badminton, we can see we are just trying now to define the problem, stage one. And there is a couple of studies trying to describe research, stage two. Um, the next step should be predictors of performance and then experimental testing predictors and then go on. But we are just uh, in a uh, model of science applied to sports. To sport, we are just uh, crowd a little bit and we have a whole bunch of things to do um, to understand and to have a model of science applied to sport. Um, we know in general, we know the game of badminton is acyclic. It's intermittent efforts with intense actions. There is a whole bunch of change of directions, random and unpredictable actions, um, open motor skills. It's an unsta unstable environment. It's a game of attack and defense. So just have to make a great management of the space and the time so we can have a good game, a good match. Um, how was the game of badminton? There is an important thing to know how it was. And then um, after that, we can go and understand how it is the game of badminton right now. So we can see here that the game of badminton in old score, when changed in 2007, if I'm not wrong, um, there's a study showing that after they changed the score, the, the, the game of badminton decreased in total match playing time, work time, work density, rest time, um, effective playing time, number of rallies, and serve. So we can see that the game of badminton changed from the old score and the uh, new score system. So that they, uh, it, it was the, the, they changed in 2007, if I'm not wrong. 
And so it, it is 13 years with the new score. And if I go through the last 10 years um, to see if the game has changed or not, we can see in the main single that there is three big changes for in the game. Uh, uh, rally time, we can see that's going up the rally time. The rest time is also is going up also. And number of shots per rally, it's going up. The other variables doesn't show any um, difference, okay? And that means if I have some um, reference, like from old games, ah, 10 years, eight years, nine years ago, that's not going to be good to be used in during my plan session, or during my plan practice session. Uh, I have to have I have to have more studies, like new studies, to be um, um, following the game of badminton. In women, there is a couple more changes we can see like uh, the rally time increased, also the rest time, um, number of shots per rally, and number of shots per second, we can see it's increased. And also decreased the work density and, and total effective playing time. Um, that means a lot of changes during the uh, games, uh, during the match of badminton in women. So again, I just reinforce that we have to have informations, new informations for the game of badminton. If we think about how is the game today of badminton, we have a couple uh, information that it's good for understand. This is one of our study from um, Rio 2016. Um, we just make with male, single male, and we compared the, all the timing variables and the shots, technical information from the groups stage and the playoff stage. And we can, it, it, we just found out that during the playoff, the game of badminton is more intense and there is a couple more volume also. Um, that means the uh, the player the when they are trying when they are preparing their, their, themselves for the this competition and they should understand that the playoff stage should be more harder to play and here in this paper we can see that there is more total time in the game there is more there is also total rest time and point more points played in the playoffs and also shots per rally that changes um, from the groups stage from the playoff stage. And also about the technical information from the shots, we can see in the playoff um, stage, there is more serve, there is more net shots, there is more smash, there is more drive and total shots. Um, we can see in the group, around 750 shots. And then in playoff stage, we can see uh, around 1,000 shots per, uh, per game in, a, in our average. Um, in, another, in the same study, we just found that around 73% of, um, of the actions is from zero to 12 seconds in a playing time. So that means if you are um, planning some session, training session for this player, they should be able to do a rally point or, or, or um, um, play a point from that, that average time from zero to 11, 12 seconds. And we can see also the rest time it's double and sometimes three times the, the playing time. So all this information is important 
because when you are doing like a um, pre-competition or even a base period of brackets, we can manage all this information. Like I can make more the, um, the playing time a little bit um, um, bigger. And then by the time we go from our planning, like in a periodization, we go to a competitive exactly with the demands of the game. Um, around 80% of the rallies frequency is less um oh, sorry is is less than 15 hits uh oh shots i mean shots sorry the translation was wrong but shots and also also there is no studies showing us the distance covered by a player in badminton games so there is only one presentation that was a banner presentation for a congress. Um, it's a kind of old study that's showing that during a badminton game, the distance cover in, in the first game was around 800 meters and the second game around 500 meters. And if I ask, I, I don't know if you ever thought about that, how how long, how far is the distance covered by a player in badminton game? That the answer should be around one, one, 1,000 meter and 500 meter, 1,500 meters around that. And we can see the second game a little bit less than the first game. And the maximum, maximum speed um, that the players can reach is around two, 20, 22 uh, kilometers per hour. And that, that's a good information. So because the court is so small, if you compare with like a soccer field and the player should be a really um, power, a really big power in such a small space. So the physical condition of the badminton player should be in, in a good shape. Um, if Oops. If you we if you go about understanding the game um, from the um, unforced errors and the um, uh, winner points, uh, we can see that that's another study that we we made it. Um, we can see that when you win the game, uh, the winners should make more winner points and less unforced errors and the lost uh, who lose the game usually makes more unforced errors and less winner point but how many if i ask you how many because you are just talking about more and less but how many should be and then in another study that we made it from talking about who how and when performs winner points and unforced errors in badminton matches uh, from data from the Rio 2006 Olympic Games, uh, we can see we just made a probability, a probability uh, frequency of victory um, based on unforced errors and winner points. And we can see if we make zero unforced errors and 15 winner points, the winning probability again is around 90-90%. And things can change if I make more unforced errors and less winner point. The probability of winning the game will be different. So we, you can manage this during a match. Like if you go to Excel and then we can add the, all this, this, both, this both information, unforced errors and winner point. And then you can manage the probability of winning in a game from your player. Um, here it was um, our first, uh, one of our first study in badminton. And it was, we, we just understand the different point difference uh, from winners and losers in games of badminton. 
And then we just divided the game of badminton, badminton in three phases. So in the, the left um, graph, we can see the letter A. We can see the first stage and then the middle, the second stage, and then in the right, the third stage. Uh, when the difference of point are um, the, the winner is, um, is ahead in the score, and, but the difference in the first stage, it's not too big. And also there is a probability of the loser to be in the game. That's difference when the, we go to the third stage or the final of the game, the, the, the third uh, stage of the game, that's the difference. It's a lot from the score, um, from the loser and the, the winner. And also there is a lot more difficult, the loser to, um, to, to gain the, the points, not to win the points. So it, should, so it will be a, a, a winner. And lately, we just uh, make a, a study with uh, some of um, scientists in partnership in, from Spanish and, and trying to understand all these uh, variables like timing variables and also technical variables, but it's not during the whole game. We are just considering um, the scoring performance because we just understand the game of badminton like um, if I'm playing against, against uh, Adrian and we are like in the beginning of the game, the demand of the game, it's one. And if we go to the second and third stage, the demand of the game should be changed. And, and, and also, um, if they score, it's... Uh, uh, really coordinated, like uh, difference in scores one, two, three points, the maximum. We just understand the score is coordinated. The demand of the game is one. And when the score of the game is not coordinated, like if I'm winning the badminton game against Adrian, like by seven, eight, nine points, oh, that would be perfect, eh? Adrian. <laughs> and and that's the demand of the game. It's kind of difference. So we just trying to understand how is this difference according to the um, scoring coordination. And then we could find that, um, let me change it here. The scoring coordination pattern between players increases as the game progress. And also at the beginning of the game until the 11th point, Players are less coordinated, um, or that means there is, we can see like a, a score with big differences. And in the second half, or after the 11th point, players uh, show highly coordinated scoring patterns because you are getting to the end of the game, and also we are getting to the end of the match. So things could be more difficult. There's a strong coordination in the knockout phase compared to group stage. That's another big difference from the knockout stage and the group stage that makes the game um, uh, even more um, strong. And the entropy showed uh, show less variability in the second half, but high in the first half. Uh, entropy is a good way a good method to understand some, some actions in the sport and it's getting right now in badminton studies also. Um, here's another study, it's not my study, but it's a kind of interesting study in elite junior badminton players that we can see um, the situation OM, that means official match and in female, the demand of official mats is around 10.74 kilocalorie, kilocalories per minute. 
And in Mayo, it's 14, almost 15 kilocalories per minute. That's the demand of physiological demands of the game of badminton. And it compared the different training sessions. And all you can see, it's not even much shuttlecock training, tactical training, physical training, or even simulated match. There is no way to reach what's the, the, the demand from the physiological official match. Um, that means that we have to look around our training, our practice session, to see um, and to make sure if um, what I'm planning and what I am doing, it will re reach what I want to, or that means the final, um, the final, the game, the official game, sorry, the official game. <clears throat> and why am I talking about all this situation? Because for example, fatigue, depends on, on intensity more than the duration of the release. The intensity of the release, we can see like shot per second, um, also the per time also, and the density of the match, that's the variables, that means intensity. And there is more important for the fatigue than the, just the duration. That means volume of the um, of the game, and also fatigue uh, could increase ankle injury from the badminton players. So if we train for different from the game, we must um, follow a street that's not going to the game. And the athlete should be more fatigued during the game. And also it just sh can show some uh, injuries in that player. Um, new perspectives about all that things that I'm talking about. I know that, that all this information could change if we talk about um, like uh, children's or young ages like under 11, uh, under 13, under 15, 17, and all this information we don't have. But what we know about the learning process, we can see that if we work with scaled uh, equip equipment like racket and, um, and curve and net high, we can um, have a good strategy to improve the performance of skill, favoring the learning process, motor learning process. That's one reason that I used to talk about it uh, for younger, like under 11, uh, we just adapt the curve, the size of the curve, the net height and the racket for to be, uh, to be more favorable about the learning process and to be more enjoyable the game because they can hit more times, they can change more uh, shots and they, it will be a lot more pleasure for them to play. Uh, if, even if we don't know yet the demand of the game in that age, but that's what the science shows us. Another uh, perspectives, I know this is a tennis study, but we can just follow the idea for the badminton. Uh, like um, the practice of badminton, usually it is uh, like um, uh, two players or even four or three players. And we try to put the shuttle um, for the opponent, like in, in, for the opponent. Um, so we can change shuttles a lot. And so what they, they found in tennis brackets that follow the same thing in badminton is a cooperation. But the game, it's totally different. The game is like a combat. It's different from cooperation. So sometimes we just 
think about our practice to understand if I am um, doing my training as they will play or they um, will not play like uh, in a cooperation system because during the match, I have to put the shuttle away from my opponent. And during a, a practice, I should put the shuttle to my practice, my, my partner and my, my opponent so we can uh, have a good practice. Otherwise, one, two, three, and then it's done, the rally or the point, whatever. So we just have to think about that. It, it is a study in tennis. We don't have a study like this in badminton, but I'm bad that it would be really good if somebody would be interested to, be, to study that stuff in badminton. Another thing that uh, I should, um, it would be really interesting to have in badminton also. Uh, this is a study in tennis. Um, it's the velocity ranges that occurs during a match. Like in tennis, we can see um, during the ranges of velocity, how far the player covered during a game. And then it kind of interesting for us to, in to understand like what happened in a badminton game. If we divided the distance covered by a player, like I talked before, 800 meters, or 500 meters, totally 1,000 1, and a half meters. And how are distributed, distributed in a range of velocity? So then we can plan our session time. And what is all this for? Why I'm talking about all this information? Where, where I am going to use, am I going to use all this information? We can use all this information during our periodization. So different periods of the year, during different periods of our training session, uh, or, or I mean training plan, we can uh, follow different uh, demands uh, as the player goes up and raise her, his or her performance. And also I can use all this information for long-term planning. Remember when I talked about young and how important would be if I work with scalonated uh, equipment and how enjoyable it will be the game and more shots and that all this favorite um, the learning process. And so if I understand long-term planning, I have to um, use all this information so sometimes it will be a lot more interesting. The player have more enjoyable and more contact with the shuttle and with the game. And then as time goes by, uh, he's going to up levels and then things can change. And also um, daily, we can change, uh, we can use all this information for a process like I used to like, I used to use. I evaluate all the players and consider all the game demands, game's characteristics, and then make a plan, execute like a training sessions, and then monitoring with um, some, some, some strategies that's really important in science um, these days. So we can go another, the, another process, we start another process with a new evaluation and then new plans, and then new training sessions, and then all this all the time being monitored. Um, just in respect, we have to understand the difference level of the players, gender, and ages, and other stuffs. Um, just to finish, um, it's, we are pretty much uh, by the end. Um, there is some important thing, and um, again, it's from a um, tennis um, study. But if you understand that at tennis and badminton, they are both racket sports. So we can understand the same thing as the idea for the badminton. Like um, 
many athletes train at a much stronger intensity and hitting duration more than what happens in the game. So make sure in your practice, in your day, if you are a coach or if you are a player, that you cannot practice stronger in intensity and duration than the game um, um, demand. So make sure we have to have all this planet to reach the good performance level. And the rest should be included, the rest time should be included, included in the training session, exactly like what happened in the games. Just be careful if you give rest time less or longer than what happened in, um, in game demands. Otherwise, you can um, train the energy supply system like different from the game. And also, all this information should help you to improve your performance, to have a better performance in, as a player, and also to decrease up your injuries for the last um, um, for the last part we just uh, I just uh, make a provocation here like take home notes um, to like for us to think about it which performance indicator best predicts your success in badminton that's um, that should be another point for the next uh, science study in badminton. Can game statics be used for forecast success? How can a successful player be identified? That's the one million question. How can I look for a 11, 12, 10, nine years old and say, hey, this is a, this is will be a successful, success, successful player. Um, Thanks for all your attention. I'm sorry again about my language is not in Portuguese. That's my, uh, my mother language, but I just try to be my best. In Spanish, it will be a little bit worse than my English. So I hope you understand. Thanks a lot for attention. And I'm, I'm here for questions. Very well, thank you, Joao, for your presentation. I know you and I know that your Spanish is also very good. Very well then, so now we are going to move on to our Q&A section. Please, if you have any questions or comments that you would like to make, you can write them down in the chat box. Well, here I have some questions uh, for you, Joao. Your presentation was very interesting. So let me tell you the following. According to the data that you have presented, what would you say of, bad, of modern badminton evolution in the last 10 years, in the last decade? Um, the science show us that the badminton um, changed from the last 10 years of the last decade. And, and also we can see that uh, there is more, um, um, it's more intense, and also there is a couple in some variables that show us some more, also more um, in volume, like uh, total points and duration of the matches and everything. And but pretty much what I can say and the science show us is the badminton game is more intense from the last decade. Good. According to the evidence that you have presented, do you consider that the training methods are being changed in order to produce a higher level athletes in terms of uh, physical aspects, tactical aspects, technical aspects, psychological aspects, and even in lifestyle aspects? Do you mean that it has changed? Do you think that training sessions are changing? Yes, 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 I do think so. In English. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I agree that um, the, uh, the, the training session 
um, cannot be considered like uh, isolated. We have to understand the training session in like in mental, in physical, in technical, in tactical aspects. Um, there is no way to understand the training session like, or the player or in, I, on these days in just one situation. So that's why I really agree and, and, and understand to have like um, in, uh, in, uh, in, in a technical part, other professionals helping the coach, helping the player. And they are talking about, everybody talking about together um, about the same thing. So it'll be a lot more interesting for the player. No. Okay, you mentioned a very important, a very interesting topic related to the processes for talent detection as well as for talent development. There are new learning uh, models uh, for children based on neuroscience and the reflection process. What can you tell us about this? Um, from uh, about 10 years ago, I just, um, I'm I'm a physical education teacher and I used to work as a fitness coach. But 10 years ago, I just stopped all my studies and just go to the psychological stuff. So we better understand this part of the body <laughs> because there is, there is such a few studies that understand our brain. And I totally agree that we have a, a lot to do um, about, um, um, about the cognitive functions. And also we have some papers um, published also that the badminton game um, can improve our cognitive function and as a rec recreational players. And that's a, good, that's a good idea. But in the high level also, we have to uh, understand that position and we have to stimulate our players um, about like making, it's not just making the decision, but, this, but making the best decision mm -hmm. in like in a, maybe uh, in one second or even more, uh, yeah, less than that. And he has to make the best decision during the game in a hurry up, in a really good um, time. So it's pretty important to, to, to have this cognitive and all the, the brain simulation during the badminton practice. I've always said that uh, badminton coaches nowadays need to be researchers. What would you recommend coaches to have more research done in your sport? Oh, Adrian, uh, what I think about that is, um, I, I, I completely understand that um, maybe there is uh, just a few persons that will like to do the investigation. And I completely understand if a coach doesn't want to investigate, doesn't want to do the, inv the investigation or the scientific research or whatever, but uh, they must understand that. And uh, Fernando Rivas, uh, that's the uh, biggest uh, coach in the world, and he's working with scientific um, studies and also um, he's doing like master and doctor degrees and all, all of that. So I just think that scientific um, research will complete the coach. And even if he doesn't like to do the scientific research, but he has to understand where I can find the answers for my questions. And if I look at my brackets, I have to have a whole bunch of questions. If there is a coach that, oh no, I'm doing this from 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and it's done, I'm doing the best, it's good. I just showed that the game of badminton has changed. If you, still, if you are still doing the same thing for the past 10, 15 years, the same thing, something is wrong. 
because the game has changed. So you have to change yourself. You have to follow the characteristics of the game. And, and so you can build, you can have a better performance of your player. So if you don't like to do the research scientific, please just try to understand, try to follow, try to go to find some answers from your question in a scientific um, research. I totally agree with you. I think that uh, coaches nowadays needed to be researchers, even if they don't like producing researches, they need to manage statistic uh, information and they need to know uh, uh, current information about badminton and where that's being produced and where they are trying to innovate and in the outcomes that the, these uh, has. Okay, so we have reached the end of this webinar. We're running out of time. Would you like to uh, make a last comment to our audience joining us today? Oh, thanks so much for everybody that, um, that was here for listening to me. And there is just a couple of views and mm -hmm. sure that's a lot to talk about it. And I like to talk. Uh, we could go through each variables and talk about that, how the implication during the practice, during the training session, and but we can do that in another time. And thanks a lot. And just remember the scientific uh, research are, are there and they should be um, accessed every time that you have some question that you don't know how to do it. Just go through it and there is a good point so we, you can find the answer and then we can follow and have a better performance for a player with the um, less injuries and some other illness. Thanks a lot for being here and thanks uh, Badminton Pan American for the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much, Joao, for sharing with us such an interesting talk as always. It's very gratifying to talk and analyze with you these badminton topics that are uh, new and that we need to be updated. To our badminton family, we invite you to our next uh, webinar entitled Training and Injuries Among World elite junior badminton players identifying problems. This webinar will be streamed next Tuesday, April 5th at 3 p.m. Lima time, when we will have the pleasure to listen to Dr. Steve McCaig from the United Kingdom. On behalf of Badminton Pan America Confederation, we thank you for your participation and we hope you like this session. Greetings, everyone. Take care and see you soon.